I work in the UK systems practice and I specialise in storage. We're going to talk in this section about the basics of ZFS technology then we're going to go through uh, open storage and how we're making use of uh, flash drives to accelerate ZFS to allow us to, us to deliver open storage products. So these are the topics we're going to go through. We're going to look at data integrity, um, talk about administration, talk about the capacity of ZFS and how it uh, isn't restricted like current file systems are, uh, and then look at the data services. So first of all, we're going to look at data integrity. So the first thing about a ZFS file system is it's a copy on write file system. So, so what does that actually mean? It means I never overwrite existing data. So if you open a file, say it's a, a presentation file, you make some changes and you save it to a ZFS file system, all of the data blocks that we're creating will be sent to free space in the file system. Only at the point, if you compare that to a, a, a normal, a, a non-copy on write file system, it will overwrite data in it where it is today. It will reuse blocks which have already got uh, data in it. In the copy on write, they all go to free space and only uh, in a ZFS file system, only at the last step of writing all the data blocks, knitting all the metadata together, do we actually make a change in the Uber block at the top of the file system. So either the file system is in the old state or the new state. That's why we call it a transactional file system sometimes. So the great thing about this is if we should lose power or have some sort of outage at some point during this process of writing the file, the file system will, on reboot, be in a consistent state. It will be in the old state. So we're either in state A or state B. If you compare that to, uh, say, UFS or many traditional file systems, you often have to go through some sort of file system checking process after a crash, and that can take hours and hours. So this improves your uptime. So how do we maintain a consistent on-disk state? In ZFS and in all file systems, we have two types of writes to consider. Buffered writes and synchronous writes. Most writes are buffered. That means they get written into system memory, into a part of the memory used by the file system, and later written down to disk. With ZFS, the way we make sure we're consistent, the way we go through the process I described in the previous slide, is that we uh, gather the instructions, if you will, that form changes to the file system into transaction groups, and we flush those through every five seconds. And this is... Uh, atomic operation. It either succeeds or it doesn't succeed. So that means we can have buffered writes but we can still maintain a consistent on disk state because we flush it through as described in the previous slide. But what if it's a synchronous write? It's a database log for example. Uh, NFS servers do synchronous writes. Synchronous writes is, is data that we cannot afford to lose. We cannot afford to have it buffered in memory uh, and in, in the event of a crash, the system will come up, and while we'll be consistent in this case, we will still potentially lose data, because that's just file systems. Here, we can't afford to do that. So we don't buffer anything in memory. We, every single write goes straight through to a special part of the file system called the ZFS intent log. And we'll talk about that more later on. So how do we know what we just read was what we wrote. Long-winded title, but how do we achieve this? We, sort of, we take it for granted that when we read data back from a file system, it is the same data that we wrote last week, last year, five years ago. And that's not necessarily the case. There are many cases where um, data can be changed. They're rare, uh, you know, some sort of strange bug in a, in a disk, for example, disk firmware, something wrong in an array controller. These things can happen. Um, atomic particles passing through your file system, whatever, things can happen. In the case of ZFS, every piece of data and metadata is checksummed. So it ha we have a fingerprint for every block. And when we read the data, we, we re-fingerprint the block and we check it against the fingerprint we have on record. And if they match, we know we're good to go. And if they don't, we know something's gone wrong. And this is unique to ZFS. No other file system can give you this guarantee. So being able to detect an error is great, um, but how do I then fix that? If I've checked some of the data block and the block is not what I expected it to be, I need another copy to be able to um, 
fix it, to be able to repair it. So ZFS supports various levels of software RAID. And we, we even make the quip that uh, ZFS restores the inexpensive to RAID. RAID's redundant array of uh, independent disks or inexpensive disks, depending whose uh, documentation you read. So what does ZFS support in the uh, software RAID levels? Does RAID zero strikes, which actually give you no redundancy at all, it's just a way of uh, putting a whole bunch of disks together for performance reasons. Mirroring, RAID Z, which is very similar to RAID 5, and, and RAID Z2, which is double parity RAID, uh, very like RAID 6. Software RAID 5, which is what we're doing here, or RAID Z, uh, software RAID 5 really is not widely used, and the reason is that, um, going back to the copy on write thing, um, with software RAID 5, I have a lot of work to do. I have to write all my blocks out, I have to calculate a parity block, and I have to write that all down to disk to have the file system in a consistent state. And if I have a failure at some point during that process with conventional volume managers, uh, I potentially end up in, a, in, a, in an inconsistent state, which I might not detect. It's called the ZFS, uh, it's called the RAID 5 write hole, and you'll find it well documented on the internet, so I won't go into it anymore. But the transactional design of ZFS just means that can't happen because we're either in state A or in state B. So how do we, how do we heal a, a bad block uh, when we found the, the checksums told us it's, it's not what we expected? Well, with either Z, RAID 1 or RAID Z, RAID Z 2, I have the ability to either reconstruct the data or I have a spare copy in the case of a mirror. So what will happen with ZFS is if it goes, let's, we've got a mirror in this example, if we go to read the block, we find it's bad here, through the checksum, we go over here, find the good copy, and copy it over. So we've fixed the data, we've fixed the file system. All happens quietly in the background. We don't have to go through great, any great lengthy resilvering process as you would have to do with conventional volume managers. We simply just fix what we need to fix. And we fix it on the fly. So that's the very basics of the way ZFS works. It's copy on write file system, it's transactional, it's always in a consistent state. So what about administration? So ZFS is a pooled storage model. If you think about conventional storage, uh, you have file systems built on volumes, the volumes are built on disks, and having the all the storage you need in the right place is difficult. You have, you, resizing volumes can be a painful experience, um, and uh, even then you might not have exactly what you want. In the case of ZFS, all of the storage goes into one big pool. All of the disks, all of the LUNs, all in one big pool. And when we allocate file systems out of that pool, um, all of the file systems, so we've got three applications in this example using three file systems, let's say, uh, all of the file systems get access to all of the disks. So the whole pool is available to all of the applications. So that is simple in respect of how we allocate space and we get the benefit of all of the disks being used by all of the apps. But what about the actual doing it? So the audience for this presentation is our system administrators, um, people with it who, who have had to experienced building logical volumes with command line. So this is an actual sequence of commands that you would use um, when creating, uh, with Solaris Volume Manager, creating a couple of mirrored volumes. And on the right is what you would do with ZFS. And here on the left, we've actually left a few steps out because um, you first have to partition the disks. You have to, and then this is all the commands you would type. And then you have to go in and edit VFS tab, make the mounts persistent. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, we don't have to do any of that. We create the... Um, the pool, which is called tank, it's a bit of a pun in all of the ZFS documents, you know, tank, pool. Um, so we create the pool called tank with a couple of mirrored pairs in, uh, and then we create the file systems with the ZFS create. And we're done. The file systems are already mounted uh, and persistently. ZFS takes case, care of all of that. So we estimate that um, we're, we're, what would take 15 minutes here, you can do in two. And you can probably do it quicker with ZFS, in fact. And if you're thinking of dozens and dozens of disks, it would be even more complicated. Simply keeping track of all of this is incredibly difficult. So one of the challenges with logical volume managers is if I create a volume and I want to add 
some extra disks into it to make the volume bigger. How do I redistribute my data? And storage arrays have the same problem. There's some, usually some sort of painful reallocation process has to take place. With ZFS, we don't have to worry about that. So let's say our pool has got four mirrors in it and we've got three file systems. Um, then ZFS will automatically stripe all the data across all of the pool, uh, disks that are available in the pool. Um, it uses various algorithms to determine which parts of the pool to use, which disks to use. But it does all of that automatically. Um, but now, if I come to add some extra storage, what happens? If I add uh, a mirrored pair 5, well now, all of the writes that happen afterwards are automatically striped across all of the mirrors. It's a copy on write file system. It just works. So this just, this just comes out in the wash. It's in, I've got more storage, I have more volumes, I'll just stripe the data um, over, over, these new, over these new disks. Reads come from where the data was written. So data that was already written, I don't have to reallocate that, I don't have to move it around. Uh, ZFS automatically effectively sloshes the data across all of the new disks. So there's no need to migrate the existing data. Uh, copy on write just gently reallocates the old data uh, as you access it. And data you don't access very much won't be reallocated, so we don't waste time. Security is a big topic and I have one slide on it. Um, ZFS has a very rich uh, ACL model, access control list model. It's very similar to that used by Windows NT and, and that's for good reason because we have a SIF server in OpenSolaris which requires that sort of rich model. But if you're a Unix person and you just want to use Chumard and all your traditional stuff, that works fine as well. From an administrative point of view, your file systems are control points. So if I create a file system called home, and then I create home directories underneath it, home file systems underneath it, if I make a change at the top of that file system tree, then it will be inherited down. So if I want to um, make it possible for all the users in that file system to create snapshots, for example, I can make a change at the top and I can switch that on. Conversely, if I want to switch it off again, I can make the change and we switch it off. Uh, and you'll see in the demonstration, the, uh, us changing file system properties and how it's reflected through the hierarchy. So we can manage logically related file systems, i.e. home directories, as I uh, said, uh, as a group. But any set of file systems that maybe store files for an application, you can change the attributes uh, en masse. And you don't have to be root to do it all. Responsibilities can be delegated. So if I want to give a specific user um, the ability to, uh, well, let's say, let's use snapshots again. If I want to give a particular user the ability to create snapshots and deny others, I can do that also. So it's a, it's a hierarchical um, security model. There are occasions where you may need to migrate a storage pool between systems or import a storage pool uh, that's on some disks that you're connecting uh, to a system, say after you've upgraded the operating system, for example. So I, had a lot of, uh, I have a lot of experience of working with thumpers with 4500s. I would be constantly upgrading the operating system, but I had a load of data on the disks. And what I would do was um, upgrade the OS and then just re-import the storage pool. I never had to recreate it. So that's because all the configuration data is stored within the data. Everything is on the disk that I need. Um, so if I do zpool import, uh, ZFS will scan all of the disks that I can see from that server, and it will tell me if there's any storage pools there, and then I have the choice of importing them. It doesn't import them straight away. I have that next step of doing the import. So that's very handy if I'm upgrading the OS. Um, also, say I was moving from a um, Solaris x86-based system to a uh, Solaris Spark-based system, well, that can cause problems because they have different endianness. The way the bytes are ordered are different, different between the processors. And once, once again, some file systems do allow you to move between processor types, but it's a real painful experience. Here with ZFS, it adapts. It, as it reads the data off the file system, it goes, oh, that was written by an x86 system, let's say. Uh, it'll go, oh, well, I'm a Spark system, so I'll just swap the bytes. ZFS will just swap the bytes on the fly. Uh, and as I access that file system, as I change data when I write it out again, then the file system will slowly be adjusted over to the new end in this. So it only makes the changes to the actual files or actual blocks that you're accessing. Um, it doesn't uh, go change the whole file system uh, needlessly. But I would say of that, that the, the, the moving between architectures is probably 
not the thing that's most important. I think it's this ability to import a pool off a set of disks that you've maybe just attached to a system uh, or you've just upgraded the operating system. You think, oh, how do I... I didn't say VFS tab. Oh, how do I do this? There's none of that required here. It all just, it all just works. <clears throat> the demo you're going to see later is all command line driven. Uh, and you'll see that the ZFS commands are very simple. But there is a graphical user interface. It ships with Solaris uh, as standard. Um, it's web-based. And I'm just going to have a quick look at that. So this is, this is the interface. Uh, if it's the first time you've ever used ZFS, you can go in here uh, and there's first time use sections. And then as you get more advanced, you can use these sections over here. Uh, you know, creating snapshots, creating storage pools. Um, so it leads you very nicely through how to use ZFS. Uh, everything's wizard driven. So here's how to create a storage pool, name the storage pool. The next step, which I don't show on the slides, would give you a, a, um, a window where you can choose the disks you want to build a ZFS file system on. And it does show you which disks are actually used for something else. So uh, you don't do anything foolish. Um, you get to review the configuration. <coughs> and this is the bit I like. If you're, if you're learning ZFS, then you can use the GUI, but then you can save the commands as a shell script. So next time you do it, you can reuse those commands um, and you can expand that shell script and, and, and do it your own way. So um, you, the thing about GUIs is they're great if you're just doing one or two things. If you're doing a load of things, you'll probably want to script it. Uh, so this gives you the opportunity, gives you a helping hand. Uh, we get to set the uh, striping level here. Um, there's contact sensitive help in, the, in, in all of the wizards. So here uh, tells me what a valid storage pool name is. Useful information like that. Here's the create a file system wizard. So once I've created a, a storage pool, I can go and create file systems out of it. Not a lot to uh, tell it, really. I just tell it uh, what the parent file system is. So when I mount a storage pool, say I call it tank, then the storage pool will be de by default mounted as slash tank. Um, so I would say, say slash tank here if I want the file system to be a, a subdirectory of that. Give the file system a name um, and bingo, I'm done. I don't have to tell it how big the file system is going to be. So let's talk very briefly about capacity. What can you say about capacity? It's big. It's a really big file system. Um, You'll have access to these slides and the speaker's notes on this slide particularly, which tells you how many directories you can have, how many files you can have. It's outrageously large numbers, um, and I don't, I don't try and remember those numbers. But essentially, it's really big. There's no practical limitation on how large it can be. Uh, and as we've talked about related to the pooled storage model, it uses that space very efficiently. So let's get into the last section, the data services. So the last section um, I'm going to talk about are the data services. You'll be seeing these in the demonstration, by the way, uh, uh, on, on live systems. These are things, snapshots and replication, things you would traditionally pay for as separate um, features in many cases. And these are all included standard in ZFS. So everything I'm talking about is just what's in ZFS. So think about ZFS is a copy on write file system. So it never overwrites the old data. So that actually lends itself quite elegantly to snapshots. Because if I say, OK, I'm going to create a snapshot, it means I have to keep a copy of the, uh, an image in, of the metadata as it was and make sure that all of the blocks that I, um, I have as part of that snapshot are no, not overwritten, so they're not on the free list, if you will. Uh, and then all the blocks that are written after that will automatically go to new space. So in case you, I take a picture of the file system, I don't use any space to do it, it's, it's a metadata state. So now all the new, all the new blocks that are written to files go to uh, new space. Um, I can have as many files, uh, snapshots as I like. The next time I take a snapshot, then I just take a, a new picture, if you will, of, of where the metadata is, and I move on from there. So I can have a very large number of snapshots. It's, it's instantaneous. Um, and, and we don't delete the old data. Snapshots are uh, read-only. Uh, they're automatically mounted under the mount point of the file system. So if I have a file system called home, 
uh, sorry, uh, called Tim under, and, un, in, a, in a pool called home, then I'll have a directory home Tim dot ZFS snapshots. And they're there for me. So in an environment where you want people to do self-service restores of files, like uh, universities, for example, love the idea of this, um, those snapshots, if I create a snapshot every day, uh, people can just go in and pull back the files they had yesterday, for example. I can create snapshots with a wizard through the GUI, um, or I can do it through the command line. Clones are writable copies of snapshots. And here we're using the command line. There is a, a wizard to do this also. Um, so imagine that I have a data set and I would like to... Um, let's use the university example again. It's, it's, so so I, I have students, I have a master data set, and I'd like 20 students each to have a copy of the same data set to, to modify. Um, I can clone a snapshot, ZFS clone. This is the snapshot. That's the snapshot name as many times as I like. I can make as many writable copies of a snapshot as I like. That, makes, that takes up no space because I've created a file system um, but I've taken up no space at this time because all of the blocks are in the snapshot. Um, when people start to make changes to their snapshot then that starts to occupy space because they're changing blocks in their copy uh, of the snapshot. So that's great. It's a very lightweight way of say, uh, sharing data. I can also say, say I want to do a major reorganization of a data set for an administrative point of view. I can make all the changes uh, to the clone, think, oh, I'm now happy with that. I'd like to put the clone into production, if you will. And I can flip around the snapshot and the clone. So we call that promoting. The, the clone becomes the original file system, and the original file system becomes a snapshot of the clone. So we, we, we still have both states of the file system available to us. We just swap them around. Similar kind of uh, wizard, again, for doing that. So the last data service is um, replication, ZFS send receive. This gives us the ability of copying a snapshot from one, well, usually from one server to another, but from one place to another. So we're getting pretty Unixy here, right? We're, uh, there is no GUI for this either. So we do ZFS send the snapshot, uh, then we pipe it through a shell off to another host, and there's a ZFS receive at the other end. So, so you'll see this in the demonstration, um, so you'll get to see how it works. But it does, it's, a, it's a nice way of creating a disk-to-disk disk -disk backup um, between two servers. Uh, I can, once I've created a, a copy of a file system using ZFS send, I can actually the next day do an incremental. So say on Monday I make this snapshot, FSS at A, and then on Tuesday I make a snapshot FSS, FS at B, then I can choose to just send the differences across. So it's an incremental backup, a disk-to-disk -disk incremental backup. So let's not pretend this is a full-blown um, enterprise replication solution. It's not, but it's a very neat and efficient way of making copies of the file systems from one place to another. We copy all the attributes over as well. So it, and, and we use this as the basis of replication in our uh, latest NAS appliance uh, by wrapping some more clever stuff around it. So we're going to do a little segue into open storage here, but this is relevant to take us through to the last part of this presentation. So Solaris and Open Solaris both have an, a ton of storage features in the ground. Obviously NFS, but we've recently added SIFs. Um, and all of this is there in Solaris or in Open Solaris. iSCSI targets. Um, and the integration point is ZFS. Everything hooks into ZFS. The ZFS command set allows us to, say, create a ZFS file system and export it, uh, make it available to host, just by using ZFS commands. Same with the SIFs. So ZFS is very much the integration point. <clears throat> and, and what open storage is about is trying to create a community around this, around this open source uh, operating system we have with all this cool stuff in, create a community where people will take our code and create their own, create their own products or change ours and fe feed it back to us. It's open source. And there are there's two companies already who've done this. Um, they're out there with commercial products based on Sun's uh, uh, open source operating system. And it's open because all the protocols, everything we do in here is open. If you want the source code, you can go get it. 
I often get asked that. What is open about open storage? Well, everything is open about it. So, ZFS allows us to use probably simpler hardware than we did in the past. Um, and this is the other part of, of open storage. Now, if ZFS can do all of this stuff, it can do checksumming, copy on write. Uh, what kind of storage might we choose to use with this? So there's now a new architectural choice. We have, for years, storage arrays, storage, storage networks, conventional storage arrays. Um, more recently, we have the concept of the storage server, Sun's Thumper, the X4500, and now the 4540, the Thor, are both storage servers, very high density. Um, but there's no hardware RAID in this. ZFS is the operating system we'd use on here to allow us to utilize all those disks. Trying to manage 48 disks um, without something like ZFS would be nightmarish. Um, and I've done it both ways. I've done it with Solaris and I've done it with Windows and I know the difference. So ZFS makes this a lot, lot easier. But this is a storage server. It's a single box. There's also now using JBODs. So using boxes of disks with not a lot of logic in, no hardware RAID, and using those with ZFS. And JBODs open up additional uh, markets to us, specifically where we want more than one server accessing the storage, for example, uh, clusters. So Sun has brought out um, a range of JBODs. This isn't a product range presentation, so I'm not going to dwell on them, but there's three products in the range. Um, and you can read tons about these on www.sun.com. But these JBODs all are SAS and SATA disks. There's a choice except for the one at the top end, which is just SATA. And a great play with ZFS. But if you want, you can put a hardware RAID card in the server that's accessing them and use other operating systems with them as well. These JBODs are all use SAS, serial attached SCSI. So I used to do a, a lot of presentations on fibre channel networks, SANS, um, some years ago. And this is very much the same story. We've gone over to a serial protocol, and, it, and a full duplex serial protocol. So we get rid of all those problems with parallel, uh, parallel interconnect. So parallel SCSI, I've got multiple cables. I'm driving it all as fast as I can. And as, that, um, as the signals travel down the cables, they will skew out. They will, they will slip out of synchronisation with each other. And it can only tolerate a certain skew on that transmission before we have to do it again. We say, well, I'm sorry, that was rubbish, I didn't get it. Um, serial means that everything's travelling serially down a single cable. And therefore, serial protocols don't suffer the problems with skew, um, and we can generally push it longer distances. So serial attached SCSI is, is the latest incantation of SCSI. Um, it's very familiar if you're used to fibre channel, you've got worldwide names. There is the concept of zoning, i.e. I can isolate certain disks uh, within an environment from other disks so that only certain servers can access them. SAS was designed from the beginning to support SATA disks, so it's built into the protocol to be able to support the older disk technology or the slower disk technology. So we have both SAS and SATA disks. And SATA is running at 3 gigabits per second today, uh, with 6 gigabits per second coming soon. One of the things that really confused me when I started looking at SAS was um, SAS-wide ports and, and four-way ports, all this discussion about these certain port types. I, didn't, I couldn't really quite visualise it. What this actually means is that you have a single port which has four SAS connections running out of it and it connects into a similar port on the JBOD. So I have four times three gigabits per second ports, uh, uh, channels going from the um, server or from the HBA through to the JBOD. And the server will have multiple three gigabits per second conversations across those various channels that are available to it. So marketing would say that's a 12 gigabit per second connection, but it's actually multiple three gigabit per second connections. So ZFS is a great play here because we have many individual independent disks in a relatively simple chassis uh, the chassis just has enough logic to manage itself, handle zoning, things like that. So ZFS allows us to build a nice big storage pool and then do all that stuff that we've talked about before, allocate file systems, snapshots and so on. So that's all great, you know, using bare naked disks um, to store all of our data, using ZFS to do all the data integrity uh, that we talked about is good, but there's, there's something out there, there is, there is a problem here. We don't have any cache. So servers, 
and CPUs getting faster and faster. Disks are significantly slower, and they're not getting faster very fast. Um, so we've had for years this problem where to actually go down to a disk uh, is really expensive for a, for a CPU. To actually go and retrieve data from a, a spinning disk is really an expensive thing. And if you look at this, we see, we see the sort of access times. Picoseconds to get information out of the caches, uh, nanoseconds to get information out of the RAM. And remember, file systems store lots of information in the system memory. Um, but milliseconds to get to the disks. So what we have now to try and mitigate this, this huge differentiation here, is the use of flash. So, so, so flash is the memory that you've got in your consumer devices, uh, in iPods, um, telephones, um, all that sort of thing uses flash. So the cost of flash has become quite reasonable compared to what it was some years ago. And flashes are now available in what's called a solid state disk. So this just, the solid state disk over in the picture here, it looks like a disk to the system that's accessing it, but in fact what you have is a number of flash banks, and remember, Flash banks don't need any power to store their contents. You know, your iPod still has its music in after you switched it off. So the flash banks uh, don't use any power to, to retain their data. We have a controller at the front of the flash banks, and this takes care of something called wear leveling and also general sort of logic you'd expect to find in a, in a disk. Wear leveling is important. Flash wears out. If you keep writing to the same cell in a flash bank, it will wear out. And the lifespan of that flash bank could be very low. Uh, and I'll give you a reference later, uh, which actually points to an excellent article talking about how Flashbank works and uh, uh, how, you can, uh, how we deal with that. But essentially the process is called wear levelling, which ensures that we don't favour certain cells over others uh, excessively and make sure that the whole life of the SSD is, is, as, is as long as can be possible. Also, there is, there, are, there is spare flash memory in an SSD. So though you may have bought a 32 gigabyte SSD, the reality is it will be significantly larger and will be using those spare cells to once again keep the lifespan of the drive uh, at, at what, would be, what we would expect around that of a conventional disk. Last part of this is a host interface. At the moment, they're all SATA, um, but there'll be SAS and, and fiber channel interfaces for SSDs in the future. So, let's have a look at the price aspect of this. A 15,000 RPM enterprise hard disk drive, these prices change, let's just use these as relative. Let's say that is $5 per gigabyte, and we can do 180 writes and 320 reads uh, a second from that drive. And it uses about 18 watts of power. Let's look at an enterprise SSD. So there are SSDs and there are SSDs. So enterprise class ones have certain features, such as the wear leveling, which make them particularly suitable for the usage we're putting them to. So they're about $35 a gigabyte, uh, 7,000 write I.O. ops, and 35,000 read I.O. ops. So hugely faster than our enterprise class drives. Quite a lot smaller, 32 gigs, we're quoting here, versus 300 for the disk. Just three watts of power. So SSDs are really fast, but they are relatively expensive. If you actually slice the cake a slightly different way and look at how much I'm paying per I.O. op, though, we see that the SSD is actually much better value. <clears throat> so how, how can we benefit from this? Just putting SSDs, replacing every disk we have with SSDs would be really fast, but it's a bit very expensive. So Sun's strategy is to use SSDs where they will actually benefit the system. And ZFS really helps us in doing this. So now we get into what's called ZFS hybrid storage pools. And this is where we use the combination of disks and flash drives to give us high performance at, at low cost. So ZFS caches blocks in system main memory. That's in the uh, adaptive read cache, the ARC, which is at the top of our pyramid here. <coughs> all synchronous writes, going back to the very beginning of the presentation, all synchronous writes go to the ZIL. And the ZIL has to be somewhere persistent. So therefore, by default, the ZIL is on disk and everything written to the ZIL, every synchronous write goes right the way through. And that can be very painful if we're writing to a 7200 RPM, uh, say, to disk, for example, because that, we have to wait for that to complete. So the database has to wait. So what we have in ZFS is the ability to separate that ZIL out 
to separate that intent, intent log out onto a separate device. And that can just be a faster disk or it can be an SSD. The beauty of SSDs is they look like disks, remember, so we don't need any uh, weird special drivers for that. So by being able to do that, we can now accelerate our synchronous writes. So for databases, doing synchronous writes uh, to, to the log files, uh, the separate ZIL on an SSD will speed that up significantly. If you want to read about this in detail, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide to Neil Perrin's log, who, uh, Neil Perrin, who actually wrote uh, the code that handles the ZIL. Traditionally, we'd, we would, to achieve, to, to fix this before, we'd either need uh, an array with um, hardware RAID cache, with a, with a RAID cache in it, and so with memory. And those caches are usually only a few gigabytes in size, so you pay a lot of money for relatively small cache or maybe even an MVRAM card in the server, which we've used in the past. But you don't need either of those with ZFS. You can just use the ZIL and an SSD in the, in the JBOD or in the server. So that takes care of sequential writes, uh, synchronous writes. What about uh, random reads? Random reads are the other thing that really stress disks out because we're hitting the disk from all the different angles and the disk can't do much to optimize it. So now in... Uh, ZFS, we have something called the Level 2 Adaptive Replacement Cache. So I said Adaptive Read Cache previously, which was wrong. It's Adaptive Replacement Cache. So we have the ARC, the normal ARC in system memory. We also have the Level 2 ARC. And what happens is that ZFS goes into the system memory and reads, uh, reads blocks lazily. We call it big, big lazy reads out of system memory. So it reads, reads out randomly read data and puts it into SSDs. Well, puts it into the level 2 arc, which can be on SSDs. The benefit here is when we now go and do a random read, and if it's not in the arc because it's been evicted by, another, by an application, say, um, or just by other blocks being stored in system memory, if it's been evicted from there, there's a good chance it'll be in the level 2 arc, which we would put on SSDs. So random reads, over time, most of our random reads should be serviced from the SSDs which are in the level 2 arc. So this means that we're not hitting the disks for our random reads. So there's some great benchmarks around this. Um, I've quoted one here. Uh, you can get the full details on Brendan Gregg's blog, um, which I've provided the URL on the bottom of the slide. Um, but he saw a 730% performance improvement on an NFS server, which was actually a, a thumper, um, a 4500, uh, when he introduced the level 2 arc, and it was a random read benchmark. So random reads now start to come out of the level 2 arc. ZFS is reading um, stuff out of the arc and putting it in the level 2 arc. Uh, synchronous writes are dealt with by the ZIL, so we're using SSDs in both of these. So one of the problems with caches is what happens if I do a sequential read? What if I stream a video out, am I going to trash the contents of the cache completely? I've, I've taken all the trouble of reading this stuff uh, into my level 2 arc out of memory. But what happens? Well, ZFS has a, a prefetch algorithm. It detects if a file is being sequentially read. And sequentially read data is effectively tagged, uh, which means that I, if, I've been, if I've read a bunch of stuff sequentially and it's in the arc, ZFS won't put that in the level 2 arc. So it actually automatically filters that out. Um, so the level to art will hold randomly read data. And bearing in mind the size of that cache is going to be you know, hundreds of gigabytes potentially versus the two or three gigabytes that you might have. So what are we moving to? How, how ZFS turbocharges applications. What does that mean? It means that with hybrid storage pools, we have our latency sensitive writes, i.e. our um, synchronous writes, will be go through the ZIL, which will be on SSDs, which are fast, much faster than a, a conventional disk. Our randomly read data will come out of SSDs because ZFS will make sure that's in the level 2 uh, arc. <clears throat> and we only actually go to disk when we need to, um, when, when ZFS is just flushing things through in its own good time. So disks almost become a backing store. And all of our active reads and writes uh, are done to SSDs. Bulk transfers, such as you know, sequential reads, will still be dealt with by the disks. So we haven't had to use SSDs everywhere. <clears throat> We've just used them where they really count. And ZFS intelligently makes use of them. So this is my last slide. So what we are 
moving from is where we need to, uh, a situation where we need many, many enterprise hard disks, so loads of 15,000 RPM disks in big expensive arrays, to an environment where we can use flash drives and some slower disks, and ZFS optimizes the way everything is done so that we will end up with equal or similar performance, maybe better performance, uh, but a significantly lower cost and significantly lower space uh, and power consumption. Hybrid storage pools are discussed uh, in Adam Leventhal's article referenced on the bottom of the slide here. Absolutely excellent article. It talks about the economics of it and the technology. Uh, so uh, that's recommended reading.